decision in the truck when the test came out. It's already here. ones I could find. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was looking for black, so. No, that's okay. That's all right. We can just, yeah, all right. I'll take him up on that. Oh, from the computer, okay. <laughs> He thought he was going to play the piano for us. Forgive me. <laughs> I hear him playing around on the, on the, whatever the, organ. the organ. Yes. Um, why don't we, let's get our hymnals out and let's sing a couple songs tonight. Um. Which one, what number is um, in a little while we're going home? Let's find that. Thank you. 626.
In a little while, we're going home. Let's sing verse 1, 2, and 3. sing one more, 522. My hope is built on nothing less. Same verses, verses 1, 2, and 4. 522. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Oh 
Some of you have heard, some of you haven't. Pastor George Gaynor is not able to be with us tonight. Um, he's got lots of snow and ice still up north. He was hoping it would melt. But thankfully, it's not predicted to freeze in Portland tonight. So tomorrow's very hopeful. Um, but I, we decided that we were going to have a conversation and discussion on righteousness by faith tonight. Um, so I want to open that with prayer, but I want to let you know that we want very much of a conversation. Um, as I was processing and thinking about this, um, righteousness by faith, I don't know what the percentage is of people in our churches that understand this. I don't know what the percentage of people that engage with Paul. I stayed away from all the books that Paul wrote for a very long time. Until I became a pastor and I had to engage with them just because the guy is difficult to understand sometimes. And yet, the beauty of the gospel, both in, in, in Paul's writings as well as I would say John's writings, comes out in just when we take the time to engage and understand and parse what he's saying, it is beautiful and amazing. Um, and anyway, so. I was just thinking that we need another format besides a lecture so that we can engage with the topic. Questions need to be able to be asked. We need to be able to stop and say, clarification, explain this to me. Um, and we need to be able to ask just real world questions. How does this work? How does the rubber meet the road in my life on the topic of righteousness by faith? So that is one of the things um, when, I, when we begin a series in February on righteousness by faith, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be engaging. So tonight, um, there's, my phone number is on the screen so that if you don't want a microphone in front of your face, which is your prerogative, text it. Heidi will grab it. She will ask your question or share your comment. Totally fine. Um, namelessly, absolutely. And, but I want to encourage us, as we're just sitting here and we're studying together, to ask questions, to let's dialogue, let's, let's talk about this, let's get clarification and understanding on the topic. Because the topic of righteousness by faith is the most important topic to sinful, fallen human beings, period. It's the question, in essence, of how are we saved? And if we don't understand how we're saved, then we're likely not saved. And if we don't understand how we're saved, we can't share this with someone else. And Ellen White tells us that the most important message that's going to be delivered with a loud cry at Earth's final moments is going to be righteousness by faith. And one of the things we'll look at before we go home tonight is righteousness by faith from all of our three angels' messages. And how does that work? How, does it, how do we get there? It's not just be afraid of the judgment. These bad guys, Babylon, are going down and watch out for the mark of the beast. There is righteousness by faith packed into every one of those. But let's, <clears throat> did we have prayer already? Nope. All right, let's start with prayer and then we'll begin our discussion Chuck's got a microphone. Please raise your hand. He will come to you. And the phone number is here. So if you want to, anyone that's watching via live stream, please feel free to engage. Heidi will, will um, recount the comments and the questions. So let's pray and we will get into our topic tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that you have made available your very own righteousness to poor, sinful, fallen human beings. 
the forgiveness of all of our sins through the blood of Jesus, and power by your Holy Spirit when we've accepted Jesus' righteousness as our own, to work and to will and to do in our lives, Father, what we could never do before. Father, teach us, open our minds and hearts, help us to engage, and just abide with us, Father, tonight. Be with us and bring us a deeper understanding both of your love and character and how you save us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So one of the first things that I wanted to do this evening is perhaps to make a list of some topics related to righteousness by faith. I think I, I made a little list earlier this afternoon. Let me pull it up here. Um, I don't want to regurgitate this, but I want to... Um, where'd it go? There it is. All right, so <clears throat> topics connected with righteousness by faith or questions that we might have, where this thread goes, I mean, I, I guess I would, we could start with, with just this question, what is righteousness by faith? Um, and we're not necessarily going to answer all of these questions tonight, but I think it will be helpful for us to get, um, get a, a list of questions that are related to our topic. What else could we ask on the topic of righteousness by faith as it pertains to our salvation, as it pertains to end time events, as it pertains to anything that touches where we live? What else could we ask on this topic? Yes? All right. <clears throat> what is it? How do we obtain it? Um, And any other questions? Uh, yes? Why is it important to us? How do we obtain it? Why is it important? So what? Um, we, I've heard this phrase growing up in the church for years. And people talk about it. People argue about it. Um, why is it important? Good question. Other questions? How can we grow? Okay, so how can we have more faith? Let me write that the right way. All right, more other questions? Whose righteousness is it? Okay, whose righteousness? Good questions. I, yes. I would like you to define righteousness. Okay. By itself. We can do that. And I think that's um, kind of encapsulated in our first. We need to define righteousness. We probably should define faith. Yeah, and whose faith? Or did you already say that? Uh, no, we didn't say that. Whose righteousness? We could also connect with this question whose faith? Actually, I'm writing this wrong, aren't I? It's whose faith? I had it right the first time? Thank you. <laughs> okay, other questions? So what is God's part? What is our part? Okay, that's a good question. It might be connected with, with this one, but let me, I'll add a new line here. God's part, our part. Good. Others? Well, since you got it. Uh, Who, what, why, why not, when? When. Okay, this is good. When, say, say it again. When will we need righteousness? When do we need? When do we need it? And when do we get it? Good question. Um, you know, as I was thinking about this, um, I don't remember the name of the gentleman that came to speak here at Grants Pass, but there was a gentleman who was in Rwanda. Do you remember this? It's been two years, maybe? Yeah. He was in Rwanda during uh, the genocide, and he had a passport 
that said he was on the wrong side. Do you remember that? That's pastor, that pastor up at Milo, wasn't it? No, this is a different, this is a different man. Um, Fididas, that's right. And he, he, lots, most of the people that had the wrong passport tore out. Was it, is it Hutu? Hutus. And Hutus. 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 Hutu was one doing the killing. Okay, so he had a passport that said Tutsi. And most of the, is that, is this, am I getting it backwards? Am I saying it wrong? I'm probably pronouncing it wrong here. Both were killing each other. Both were killing each other. All right. All right. Thank you for that. He was evidently in a part of the country where he did not, you know, his passport had the wrong name and he, he was going to be killed. And most people were ripping that part of their passport out, out of fear. And he said, I can't do that. I'm not going to. And I, it just was, I was thinking about this. And at a time in, in the judgment and earth's final crisis, Jesus tells us we need to be clothed and not naked. And that's the moment when Christ's righteousness will be the greatest uh, asset that can be found. And it will be available, for, it's available for free today and will be available for free until the moment the doors of the sanctuary close. But that is what we want, Christ's righteousness covering us so that in the judgment, we come out on the right side. That we, our names are written in the book of life and not under condemnation. Anyway, that time is coming. Chuck, yes. I think you answered the question. If righteousness by faith is essential for our salvation. It is absolutely essential for our salvation. Um, what are some other questions? I'll, uh, let me, let's, uh, other questions. I mean, we might ask, what is the nature of man? Um, is man good, essentially? Or is, does he just need to cultivate the good that's in him? Um, we could also ask, what is the nature of Christ? What nature did Jesus take when he came to be with us? What are some other questions we could ask in connection with this? Bob? What did uh, Jesus say about this topic? Oh, what did Jesus say? Jesus' comments um, or Jesus' teaching on this particular topic. Okay, okay. Here's another kindred. Is justification uh, by faith the same as righteousness by faith? We could also ask the question, sanctification. sanctification. What is sanctification? Sanctification. Um, and is that also by faith? These are all important questions. Other, any other questions? Yes. How long do we need uh, righteousness by faith? How long do we need it? Okay. When do we need it? When do we get it? I'm going to add that at the end here. How long do we need it? Or is it needed? I, I guess if wanting to know how long we need it, is it a permanent fix? then <laughs> all right good is it temporary or permanent temporary or permanent other any others i think this is a good list one more pastor oh great um can we lose it okay um and if so how Dave? How do we share it? How do we share it? Okay. With fellow Christian brothers that we, and sisters that we know. Okay. The best way to share it. What is it? What is the best way to share this topic with others? When I got down there, I could see that 
the train of all my comments here is going downhill. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. Another question we could we could ask is, um, and Paul deals with this. Jesus mentions it. What is the carnal man? And then what is the spiritual man? And how does that relate to this topic? What will it cost us? Ah. Is righteousness by faith free? Or does it cost us something? These are all good questions. Is any more? Um, <laughs> take us about a year. Take us about a year. Um, another couple other ones we could ask. We could we could ask, what happened? Uh, what happened in 1888? And why is it such a big deal? Um, also, we could ask this question. Um, Can I be perfect? And how do we define perfection? Um, is perfection possible? And how do we define that? All right. How do we know that we have it? Can we know that we have it? All right. Assurance, we might call this. Can I know? Can I know that I have it? Can I know that I'm saved? All right. This is, uh, we're starting to scratch the surface of the topic here. Um, and I think it's, I think it's good. Let me share with you. There's a couple quotations um, that I want to share with you from the pen of inspiration from the writings of Ellen White. Um, when I first started my ministry, I didn't do very much with Ellen White because I didn't know the Bible well enough. And she tells us we need to study the Bible and understand the Bible first. And that's what I did. And... <clears throat> I've been going through the Bible once a year, every year for a long time now, and I'm not trying to say that I've mastered the Bible, but I'm feeling more need to study her writings. Um, and I don't know where you stand with, with her writings, but as a kid, um, somehow I heard all the, the harshest of her statements and the most... Uh, the most difficult things that she might say. And um, it didn't necessarily endear me to her message or to what she said. And then um, as I progressed in my Christian experience, uh, people would quote, especially things connected with 1888 and righteousness by faith, things that she had said. I was like, that doesn't sound like the Ellen White I was told about. Um, and it's pretty amazing. Let me share with you um, some of the some of the things that she has. I think these are some significant quotes from Ellen White on the topic of righteousness by faith. This is one of them from Review and Herald, December 23, 1890. She says, "One interest will prevail." One subject will swallow up every other. Christ, our righteousness. Um, this one is an amazing statement to me from Faith and Works, page 19. She says this, There is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all. She said the same thing three times. She says, this is important, important, important. And then she says this. This is what needs to be established more firmly in the minds of all. 
than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. I, I hear statements that she made like this, and these were not always the statements that, were, that, were, that I heard as a young person. You know what? And sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you end up with statements that seem to conflict. You read Paul, and then you read something that James wrote, and one of them's talking about salvation by faith, and the other one's talking about the salvation um, is shown through our works. And it's easy to get those to get the wires crossed when you're when you're studying the same thing can happen when we're studying um, the spirit of prophecy quotes on this because she talks you know here's salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ alone but then she'll say things that talk that sound like James and say you know that without accompanying works man cannot be saved which is absolutely true and this is why I was very thankful for that book entitled Faith and Works. Because I'd hear people talk about faith. All right, I think I understand now. Faith, I need faith. I don't have righteousness without faith. And then I'd hear, and, and my works have nothing to do with it. And then I'd hear people talk about the importance of having good works. And I'd say, wait a second. Well, I thought, I thought it was faith. And understanding which comes first and why, and then what follows as the natural result of the first, is absolutely vital. Here's another, question, another quote from Gospel Workers. She says this, Our churches are dying for the want of teaching on the subject of righteousness by faith in Christ and on kindred truths. I think we just made a list of kindred truths to the topic of righteousness by faith. She also says Pastor, this. Yes. Is there a date on that? Oh, let me give you a date on that. Yeah, okay. uh, let's see. I don't have a date on that quotation. It's from the book Gospel Workers. It's page 301. Okay. Um, and sometimes her statements are published in multiple, multiple books and multiple writings. So that one doesn't have a date. Okay. I'm sorry. We'll have to research that. My hunch is that it was 1887 and onward. Yes. That's my hunch. All right, so here's another one. When the free gift of Christ's righteousness is presented, I'm, yeah, let's see. When the free gift of Christ's righteousness is not presented, the discourses are dry and spiritless. The sheep and lambs are not fed. <clears throat> another, Christ and his righteousness, let this be our platform, the very life of our faith. That's from Review and Herald 1905. And here's another one, Selected Messages, Book 1, 359. The present message, justification by faith, is a message from God. It bears the divine credentials, for its fruit is holiness. What she's saying is that if, if you want to understand if a message is from God or not, what kind of fruit does that teaching bear in the life of those who accept and receive it? Those who receive uh, a teaching, a doctrine of uh, Jesus paid it all, which he did, and I don't have to keep the law, they live out their belief in a certain direction, tending toward antinomianism, tending towards away from obedience to the law. But Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And understanding that connection. So she says, messages that bear the divine credentials are those that when they're received into the life and heart, bring us closer to holiness and obedience and a greater desire to do God's will than before. That's how we can test if a message is from God or not. One of the ways. Here's another one. And this is... Um, this is a very well-known uh, statement. Um, and we could probably spend our whole time just studying this statement. But this is what she says. The Lord in his great mercy sent a precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. That means Jesus on the cross. 
the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. That's Jesus is our surety. He's the one. You know, when you become surety for somebody else, if you ever co-sign on somebody's, uh, like somebody gets a loan on their car, if they don't pay it, you become surety for them. Guess who's going to pay it if they don't pay it? They're going to come looking for you. And this is what this is what Jesus has done. When he created us, he signed off. If Edward sins, my life in place of his. That is what we need to see and understand. That breaks the heart with love for a God who would do such a thing. It transforms the life. If God so loved me and he set me free, if I will just grab hold of this gift, take hold of it by faith, trust him that he loves me enough to send his own son so that I wouldn't have to perish, that begins to transform the life. The, the, the natural outflow of someone who understands what God has done for them is a transformed life. Now we can turn away from that. We can turn back and go back to our vomit like the, the wise man says. We can do that. But we do that at peril to ourselves and we do that um, we do that at great pain to our Heavenly Father. She goes on. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited people to receive the righteousness of Christ. Now this is justification through faith, because that's what's in the very same, the very previous line, which is then made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. What she's saying is when justification by faith is received and experienced by the sinner, it leads to obedience. What will begin to manifest itself in the life is faithfulness, love to God, and the desire to keep the commandments of God. And then she says this, Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, to his merits, his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. The message of righteousness by faith is the final most important message that we have been entrusted with to give to the world. If we don't understand it, if we have not experienced it, if we don't, aren't willing to share it, then woe to us. Because there's nothing more important than this. And, and like I said, as I was thinking about this topic, we have to be able to dialogue and talk. You have to ask. There are no stupid questions. And if you're too nervous to grab the microphone and and ask the question, then by all means, text it in. Because I can guarantee you that 30, 50, 100 people have the same question, but they're too afraid to ask it. We need to understand this topic. All right, so we've got about 25, well, maybe 30 minutes left. Um, And as we look at this list... Let's pick two or three things tonight that we can cover, not exhaustively. I'm not prepared to cover things exhaustively. But we can cover and get a little primer uh, in preparation for our week together with Pastor Gaynor. Um, I wanted a whole week. He, w- he wasn't able to, uh, to give that. So we worked from Wednesday through Sabbath with two, two messages on Sabbath. But this... This uh, is designed to be a spiritual refreshing and a refocus on Jesus at the beginning of our year for all of us. Because connecting with Jesus is the most important thing. So let me ask you, of, of these things here, where should we start? And not exhaustively, but just where should we start? And let's, let's go through some of, some of this. Where should we start? Okay, all right. We're going to examine we're going to examine what is justification 
What is sanctification? What is righteousness? And let me add to that, what is faith? Okay? Um, let's start with justification. Um, and let me pull out... <coughs> yes, question. What was the reference of the last quote that you read? The, very, the last quote that I read? Yes, let me share that. Um, this is in multiple places in her writings, but where I drew it from tonight is Testimonies to Ministers, page 91 and 92. That's where she's talking about the most precious message that came through elders Wagner and Jones. So Testimonies to Ministers, page 91 and 92. It's in other places. But if you, if you search for these words, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message. You'll pull up all the places where this is. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message. Um, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 19, is it? I'm sorry, Luke chapter 18. We're going to go to Luke chapter 18. We're going to look at verse, start with verse 9. This is, this is uh, one of the answers to Bob's question. What does Jesus say on the topic? This is one small place where we could draw something about what does Jesus say on the topic. And this is, he's talking about being justified. Okay? So let's read this together. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. And it's very interesting why he told the parable. Okay? Verse 9 says, Also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Okay, this, this largely would have been the class of, of Pharisees. Pharisees often were trusting in their own righteousness. I'm keeping all the law. You know, we, you read in Philippians chapter 3, and Paul says, you know what? According to the law, I was blameless. I achieved. I did it. And then he took one look at Jesus, and he says, everything that I thought was of value to me and righteousness, I found to be dumb. I found it was worthless. And he shuddered in himself. <laughs> to trust in his own righteousness. This is why Jesus tells this parable. He tells this parable, and by the way, we could, we could also say Jesus told this parable in our day so that sorry Laodiceans who trust in themselves and think that they have, we have an abundance of goods and we are in need of nothing and we are rich and we've become wealthy, same class. So when we read this, Jesus is speaking to us. He's not speaking to somebody out there. He's speaking to us. We don't understand. So here's the story. Verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Now the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. It's interesting. He's praying more to be heard by the people that are there and praying more to kind of just inflate his own ego. He's not really even addressing God. It's, uh, he's praying with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The Pharisee was very impressed with himself. <laughs> And the Pharisee was working very hard. I have no doubt that this man was a man of zeal. I have no doubt that this man was a man that wanted to be in the kingdom of God. Sometimes we, we take the character, we caricature the Pharisee and, and make them these evil, horrible people. This man was a man who was in the church, was trying to serve God, probably would have been one of our Sabbath school teachers. You know, this is, this is not some, somebody that's way over there removed from us. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, sometimes, um, in my own experience, there's been times that I have, in my own mind, many times, patted myself on the back for what a great job I'm doing and what a good human being I am. 
Sometimes as a pastor, you sit and listen to other pastors sharing messages, and, and, and the, this thought will go through my brain. Well, I've, I've done a lot better job at presenting that message than this guy. You know what that is? That is a cockroach that's coming out from under our minds. And what we need to do is step on that, confess our sins, and say, Jesus, forgive me, a sinner. This kind of thinking, it goes through all of our brains. We think great things. Or whenever we're despising or looking down on someone else, well, look at that person. What a, what, a, what a wretch of humanity they are. You know, John. I think it was John Wesley who said, you know what, except for the grace of God, that would be me right there. That's the attitude that someone that's seen the righteousness of Christ and Christ's beauty and understands the wickedness and wretchedness that's in our own heart, that's the attitude we need to retain. And whenever we see the little cockroach of self-righteousness or sometimes the giant cockroach of unrighteousness, we have to beat him back or, Lord, get this thing out of my life. We, this, is, this is what the Pharisee is dealing with. Yes? There's a little, there's a little excerpt here from uh, Christ Object Lessons related to that. If I can read yes, it. please do. Please do. No outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. But no man can empty himself of self. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy properties. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. The nearer we come to Jesus, and the more clearly we discern the purity of his character, the more clearly we shall discern the exceeding sinfulness of sin, and the less we shall feel like exalting ourselves. Those whom heaven recognizes as holy ones are the last to parade their own goodness. None of the apostles or prophets ever claimed to be without sin. Men who had lived nearest to God, men who would sacrifice life itself rather than knowingly commit a wrong act, men whom God had honored with divine light and power, have confessed the sinfulness of their own nature. They have put no confidence in the flesh, have claimed no righteousness of their own, but have trusted wholly in the righteousness of Christ. So will it be with all who behold Christ. Those who are filled with self-esteem and self-love do not feel the need of a living personal on union with Christ. The heart that has not fallen on the rock is proud of its holy wide enough to take in their own attributes. Thank you. You know, Jesus is constantly trying to break through our tough exterior. Um, sometimes we erect these walls because we're trying to protect ourselves. Sometimes it's because of how we've been treated in our families early on, or maybe berated and looked down on at school. I'm never going to let anyone look down on me ever again. You know, I, I don't know exactly all the reasons and all the ways that Satan causes us to get to these kinds of places, but. You know, and, and with Laodicea, the problem is Laodicea is just ignorant and blind and cannot see where the things in their life are actually repulsive to God. Um, this is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you're not getting into the kingdom. And then he goes on to say, you know what? You've heard that it was said, whoever murders you know, is going to be in danger of, you know, hellfire. I don't, I don't remember exactly what he says there. But I tell you, if you're irritated with your brother, you're breaking that law. Jesus was trying to wake us up to that it's not the action in our hand. You know, I didn't murder anybody. I sure was irritated with my wife all week long. That is sin before God. You know, he also, he also brings that out with, with adultery. You've heard that it was said, you know, that uh, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, the man that looks at a woman to desire her, just to take in her beauty, admire it for himself, to desire it, he has broken that command. 
That is the root nature of the law. And then Ellen White goes on to say that all selfishness is sin. Whenever my own self-interest is more important than stopping to help somebody else, I don't have time to have that conversation. I don't have to, I've got to get somewhere. I have something more important to do than help this or that or whatever. When it's self-interest, I'm sinning against God. I'm sinning against that human being that I'm ignoring. And Jesus spoke in words like this to try and wake us up. Because we don't understand where, where and how and all the ways that we sin just in our mind. So that's why Jesus' language. So back to Luke chapter 18. So that's the Pharisee. He's standing there. God, I thank you. And the people looked at the Pharisees. They didn't do anything wrong. They gave liberally at the temple. They seemed to be holy and righteous men. And when they heard Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds these guys, you're not going to make it. They said, who in the world is going to make it then? We don't know. We don't know. And this is, this is why Jesus is, is raising the law to its rightful place at the infinite standard of righteousness. So that we would understand that we can never attain to that. The law is the schoolmaster that drives us to the cross where we find the righteousness of God. That is what we need. Here's how it continues. This story continues. After the Pharisee congratulates himself that he's not an adulterer, he's not extortioner or unjust, or even like this tax collector, but he fasts twice a week and gives tithes of all that he's possessed. Verse 13, And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. This is a brokenness of spirit. This is a, a, an, a, an acknowledgement of the holiness of God and the defilement within and throughout. He wouldn't even lift his eyes to God, but beat his breast in sorrow. You know, this is you know, equivalent to tearing his clothes and putting on sackcloth and ashes, beating his breast, mourning over his condition. And then he says these seven words, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That is an amazing prayer, if we stop and think about it. Number one, the man acknowledges that he's a sinner. Number two, he has enough faith in the goodness of God to ask, to even go into God and, and, and believe that he is, he is good and he exists and he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's how Hebrews defines faith. This man says, I'm... Woe is me, I am undone, I am wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I have nothing, but I have one hope. It's God. My hope is that God, because I've heard about God, He's merciful, He's gracious, abundant in loving kindness, forgiving transgression and sin. And He goes and throws Himself on the mercy of God Almighty. And what does He find? He finds God's God is merciful. God is gracious. And Jesus tells us what happens. He beat his breast. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He exercises faith by the prayer that he sends to God. He acknowledges his own sin. He confesses. And then Jesus says, I tell you this, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, whom everyone thinks is the worst of the worst, a, a traitor, a traitor to the nation and a thief by trade, essentially. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. That means right with God rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. What do we learn from Jesus' parable about what it means to be justified yes Gloria um, I, it just appears to me and I understand what you're saying and I've always gone along with that um, train of thought but what I see is this man is putting himself down he's focusing on himself and how terrible he is mm -hmm. and 
and we're counseled not to do that. Yes. So um, why, sure. why is Jesus extolling this? Okay, so the thing, and, and Gloria is bringing out a good point. Ellen White counsels us that um, sometimes there are people that are so zealous and so self-conscious that their eyes tend to drift down from the Savior and looking to themselves. And they're constantly berating themselves, beating themselves up, saying things like, I I'm, I'm miserable, I'm awful, I'm terrible. I can never attain, I can never do it. I don't know all the things that, you know, I don't know all the things that we, we say to ourselves in our mind. And Ellen White says we should not do that. We should not look at self and look at how miserable and rotten we are. She says, lift your eyes and look to the Savior who died for you. Look there and find, and, and we don't know the inner thoughts of the tax collector. But obviously Jesus said that this man was doing this right. This man humbled himself before God, acknowledged his sin, he, but he didn't stay there and revel in that because he was sending a prayer up by faith to the only one who could grant him mercy, forgiveness, and salvation. And he tur by turning away from looking at himself to looking to the Savior, this is where the man exercised faith. And, and yes, you know, sometimes two people can do the exact same thing outwardly and one does it from one motive and the other does it from another motive. And I would say the tax collector and the self-berating person who only keeps their eyes on themselves externally may look very similar. But internally, what they do and how they're calling on God is the difference. So I'm not going to go into that. I haven't studied this to the extent that we probably need to to deal with it, but I think that's the core issue here. Uh, Carol, go the, I'm sorry. The, <laughs> sorry no. the, there's an extra little thing from Christ's object lesson saying that self to the public and appeared nothing but shame. Thus it must be seen by all who seek God. By faith, faith that renounces all self-trust, so we still can't trust in self, right. but we also don't want, like you're saying, look to self. But we need to, the needy suppliant is to lay hold upon the infinite power, and that's where we need to focus. Amen. I mean, it's a fine line here, but at the same time, we need to focus where the power is coming from. That's exactly right. And I, I don't know if Ellen White said this, but some, somebody said, we should glance at ourselves and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. If we focus on this wretched man that I am, Satan will take hold of that and we'll be swirling the drain very soon. We cannot afford to look and stay looking at sinful self. Because you do that and you say, I'm never going to make it. I'm, I'm a terrible, awful person. I'm this and I'm that. And when you start talking like that, now you're saying, God, even God can't save me. You're, you're exercising the very opposite of faith. It is just down on yourself. This is why we have to, this is why the book of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author of our faith at the cross and the finisher of our faith when we stand before the throne of God, um, with, with no spot or blemish. He's the author and the finisher of our faith, and we can only receive that by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Chuck, Linda has a comment here. I think it was Jeanette Stark that recently did uh, in her Facebook column that uh, what you're saying reminds me of that. It's like it's like trying to drive by looking in the rearview mirror. <laughs> you know, w if you're looking at yourself and you're, con I mean, you have to acknowledge your sin, but if that's what you're focusing on, you're focusing on the past, actually, what's yes. in the rearview mirror. Yes. You gotta glance there every once in a while, but you gotta keep looking ahead. Amen. Or you're gonna crash. Amen. I really like that. I think that is pertinent to this issue because sometimes we look at all the ways we failed in the past and we're mourning them and we're still mourning them. 
And we need, to, we need to come to Jesus and say, Lord, please save me from the wretched man that I am, but help me look forward to the cross and give me the power I need every day. Give me the justification, the forgiveness uh, that I need. So this, this word justification means to, be, it means to be set right with God, um, which means to be fully forgiven and fully accepted as if we had never sinned. And the reason why God can do that is because when we look to Jesus, when we look to the cross and we say, Jesus is my substitute, and we allow our sins to be placed on him on the tree, then he gives us his righteousness. And this is... We'll talk about this. Here's another thing we could add to this mix is the difference between imputed and imparted. And this probably needs to be part of our conversation at some point when we talk about justification and sanctification because justification is imputed or credited to us and sanctification is imparted. It becomes part of us. And these are two different things. So this, this part of the conversation needs to come in later. But justification, being set right and forgiven and accepted by God fully as if we had never sinned is something that the Bible teaches throughout in every story and in every um, conversation that only can occur by faith. And the example of the tax collector. I, I, like to, I like to simplify things. I like to do things that, um, I, that help me remember. And for me, this little acronym helps me remember. To confess my sin and who I am. To humble myself and come before God knowing that he doesn't owe me anything. As a matter of fact, everything that I have is a free gift to an undeserving sinner. And to, the A is to ask. And finally, once I've asked and leaned on God's mercy to trust, this is everything, everything the tax collector did. Did he confess that he was a sinner? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did he humble himself before God? Yes. yes. Did he ask for the mercy of God? Yes. And you know what? Though it doesn't explicitly say that he trusted, it does say that he went home righteous. And if justification or righteousness is only by faith, then we know that he trusted too. Amen. This man did everything that he needed to do to receive this justification. Okay. Let, let, let me quickly touch on the other comment. Yeah, I, uh, question. Yes. Um, how, how many times can justification happen? How many times? All right. Uh, good question. Um, how many times do we sin? How many times do we sin? How many times do we go back to our vomit and do the same thing over again or find some new thing to do that's an offense to God? You know, um, there's a spirit that wakens Job up in the night. Or actually, it's one of his friends. And he, he talks about that man drinks iniquity like water. And that's a message from the devil. That's a message that's sent to drive us and to make us look at ourselves and all of this. And he goes on to say, who, you know, can you be more righteous than your maker? And, and you know, you're just going to be crushed like the moth. I think it's in Job chapter 4. It's very, there's not a shred of hope in that, in that message. And so we know that that's coming from the evil one. And that's probably a little bit about what Gloria is saying. We don't want to go there. We want to stay right here where we, where we don't stay in confessing and don't stay in humility, but we get to the place where we're going to ask and then trust. This, ha this is the essential part. We have to do that. But um, we sin continually. We're ignorant. We don't understand. And, and every time that we sin, let's say I've lived, I, and, I, and I have, I've lived 50 years. I've got 50 years of sin. Let's say I was an unbeliever and I've never once asked for Jesus to forgive me of my sins. Never once. But I come to a meeting, I see both my own condemnation and the goodness of God. And in that moment, I say, Lord Jesus, like this man, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
all of my sins are put to Jesus' account. He already put them to his account. It's just me saying, I give the okay to do that. Because Jesus suffered under the weight of the sins of the whole world at the cross already. The only question is whether I'm going to choose to hold on to my sins and suffer for them, or when I'm going to acknowledge my need of a Savior and submit to what God has already done in my behalf. That's the only question. So 50 years old, I'm a sinner I've never asked to be forgiven before, and I come in that moment, all of my 50 years of sin is nailed to the cross. Jesus already bore my sins on the cross. I go home like this man. Jesus said, do you know who went home justified? This man went home justified. But tomorrow, I got 50 years of doing it wrong. I'm going to sin again. I'm going to sin again. I'm going to sin again. And as long as the doors of mercy are open, I can come to Jesus a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand times a day and receive justification every, every, over and over and over again. If we think that justification by faith is something that happens one time and never needs to happen again, then we don't understand the true nature of the sinner and that we are continually, continually sinning. All right, one other, one other point that we need to deal with is sanctification. What is sanctification? So the root word of sanctification is holiness. Hagios, I think, in the Greek. Um, to be sanctified means to be holy. And um, the book of Acts tells us, well, the book of Romans and many, many other places in the New Testament tells us that justification is something that can only happen by faith. In the book of Acts, I don't remember exactly where it is, but in the book of Acts it says that sanctification is something that can only happen by faith. And it's the process of the Holy Spirit coming into the life and the heart of a man and beginning to write the law of God in that heart. The things that I used to love and do, the sin he begins to make me have a loathing for. And he begins to write the law of God in my heart. And through a process of coming to the cross every day and being justified when I fall every day and continually asking for the Holy Spirit, this process sanctified by being sanctified by faith is a... Ellen White puts it this way, justification is the work of a moment while sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As long as we're alive, there'll be something we need to be sanctified from and brought more and more fully into the character of Jesus Christ. And that only happens when we submit to the whole, when we submit to God's form of righteousness and by faith are asking for that. And when we are daily asking for the Holy Spirit to abide in us and change our thoughts and feelings and write the law of God in our heart. And together, justification and sanctification total all the righteousness that we need, both imputed and imparted. So when we say righteousness by faith, we're saying both justification and sanctification by faith. This is the holistic view of this. And um, so righteousness by faith, in technically speaking, is connected is both of these aspects. And this will result in this. A true faith for what Jesus has done for us at the cross will begin to transform the life. And if we continue to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh, sanctification will be continually taking place in the life of the believer who is trusting in Jesus. All right, questions? We've got maybe, maybe five or ten minutes left for questions. I think, I think hopefully righteousness, faith, justification, and sanctification, there's a lot on this board, but hopefully we have some understanding now of what these terms mean and are, at least as a starting point. Any questions or clarifications or, or comments on, on what we have looked at? Yes, Gloria. Oh, I had to pop your balloon, but um, 
I still don't have a good idea of what is meant by righteousness. Christ has righteousness. He gives it to us. Uh, um, and I was thinking about the full armor of God. We, have, we wear the breastplate of righteousness. Is, is it right doing? Is it a right attitude? What? Thank you. I, I just don't have a good Thank grasp. Thank you. Um, we are, forgive me a little bit this evening. I am shooting from the hip. I was not expecting to make this presentation tonight. Um, but I think Gloria asks a very important and fair question. Um, I'm going to read several scriptures that talk about and define, and, and I think she's absolutely right. We really haven't defined what righteousness is yet. We've talked about it in terms of justification and sanctification. Let me share with you five or six scriptures here, and let's see if we can get a, a good understanding of what righteousness is before we go home tonight. Psalm 119, 172. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Okay, this is one definition the Bible gives us. God's commands are righteousness. And those commands can be boiled down to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. So this is one definition of righteousness. It's 100% right. Psalms 119, 172. All your commandments are righteousness. Okay, here's Isaiah 51, verse 7. Listen to me, you who know righteousness. And then it repeats this again with the, with the Hebrew um, parallelism. It says, you people in whose heart is my law. So Jesus, uh, Jesus, I mean, the Spirit inspired Isaiah to say, listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. God is talking to the people whose, whose law is in their heart. They have the desire to keep it and do it in sincerity. That's another, another understanding of what, how righteousness can be defined. Romans 9.31 says this, But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. So here's three verses that very clearly connect righteousness with the law of God. Very clearly. Here's another, Romans 2.26. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? So the requirements of the law, Paul is telling us, is righteousness. Here's another one. This is from Hebrews 1.9, and I think it's quoting from... Psalm 45, if I remember, it says, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. So this is telling us that right, if righteousness is the law of God, which is love God, love my neighbor, do other-centered good continually, then lawlessness is the antithesis of righteousness. Righteousness and lawlessness are completely, they're, they're antithesis. They're, they're, they're completely incompatible. Here's another one. This is from Steps to Christ, page 61. Righteousness is defined by the standard of God's holy law as expressed in the ten precepts given on Sinai. And lastly, uh, Christ Object Lessons, page 314. He who becomes a partaker of the divine nature will be in harmony with God's great standard of righteousness, his holy law. So all of these scriptures and all of these from the spirit of prophecy are t pointing all in the same direction that righteousness is conformity to the great law of God, which the root principle is love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and more and further beyond that, love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you, Gloria, for asking that important question. Chuck. Can I just share this uh, yes. thought from Mount of Blessings, page 18, on righteousness? Righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love. It is conformity to the law of God, for all thy commandments are righteousness. 
and love is the fulfilling of the law. Righteousness is love, and love is the light and the life of God. Amen. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving him. So in that one paragraph, it tells us what righteousness is. I love that. Times. That's I an amazing. Know. Where is that found again, Char? Mount of Blessings, page 18. Mount of, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 18. Um, beautiful, beautiful definition of what righteousness truly is. You know, I want to I'll say one more thing and then we'll close our meeting tonight. The, the Ten Commandment law of God tells us to love God and love our neighbor. It does not tell us to love ourselves. The world tells us to love ourselves. The world tells us to take care of self. We don't need to be told that. We naturally do that. <laughs> Somebody attacks me, I'm going to shield myself from them or I'm going to go on the counteroffensive. Somebody does slights me, I'm going to slight them back. Um, I don't, you know, a kid doesn't have to learn not to share. They have to learn to share. We are naturally selfish. And selfishness is the exact opposite of love. Love is thinking of the other person's best good, while selfishness is sitting there scheming, how can I get them to do what I want them to do and get, make all of this run around me? Selfishness is the antithesis of righteousness. It's the antithesis of love. And that is why, that is why love for self and renunci love for self is completely incompatible with the law of God. And everyone who follows Jesus must crucify self because it's the very root of sin. It's what drives all other sin. One more comment before we go. Maybe there's two questions here. I'm just hoping that we can come to grips with some of this as with uh, the uh, other thing, part of that righteousness by faith is that faith in Jesus or the faith of Jesus. Thank you. And so I'm hoping that can be answered along with all of this. Thank you. Faith in Jesus. Are we supposed to have faith in Jesus? Yes. Absolutely. Revelation also talks about the faith of Jesus. Here are they, and what is the difference? With, that's another topic, uh, an important topic that we should address in the future. Heidi, you had, is there a comment or question from our... Oh, well, anyone? no, from okay. me. <laughs> that's fine. And it's not very well... Uh, I'm going to stumble over my words because I don't know how to articulate it. Um, just when you were saying about take care of yourself first, um, it was a worldly thing, right. and it made me think of those who have suffered trauma and how, how they would rather not deal with self, be, as, in, as in looking at themselves, looking and dealing with the trauma. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so when we say we don't need to, deal with it, we're selfish enough as it is, okay. that helps bury some of that there. Yes. But how does righteousness by faith heal us from our trauma, heal us from our, because I do agree, the world does say, um, take care of self first. And in some contexts, like, a, a, like a, a self-serving, all that kind of, we can clearly see that that's wrong. But when you have suffered trauma, which I would say, 100% of us have. Um, but those who are especially vulnerable suffering from trauma, um, I, I still think that, that we can still say that it's not necessarily the right thing to, to deal with self first. However, I don't, I'd want to say it a lot more delicately than I'm doing right now. I'm very much stumbling over my words, but, um, but I think Christ's righteousness does heal that trauma and how does that yes. work? I think that's a very good point um, that you're bringing out. One of the things when we talk about pride, it's often overt pride that I comes to my mind. Um, look at me, I'm the greatest, I'm the best, I'm going to dominate. Um, but there is another kind of pride that is that stands apart from that kind of pride, external, you know, glorify, self-glorifying. There's another kind of pride, and it's, it's, it's an unhealthy focus on self that leads me to, to draw myself inward. 
I'm afraid if other people are looking at me. I, I'm so hyper aware of myself. And I don't want anyone to be offended or hurt by me. Or And, and someone that's in that situation is, like Heidi's talking about, very, very high probability that there's a great degree of trauma that has has um, affected them. And, and people that are in, sometimes people that are in a situation like that, um, they are, they, it's too much for them to deal with their own brokenness. And they're looking to go and help. I, 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 they just want to, I don't know, a, a mental rug to sweep all their past and all their hurt. And they, it's so painful, they can't face it. They can't look at it. They can't deal with it. And so instead of doing that, they're going to try and help other people. But they're still broken. They're still wounded. They're still hurting. And that past still affects them. And one of the things that I would say that a person in that situation needs to understand is that they need to... They need to take care of self. And when I say this, I mean, what I mean is they need to take themselves to the foot of the cross, to the only one that can bring full and true healing in their life. That's the kind of, because if they don't deal with their past and their brokenness and all of that, they will continue to carry, carry that. They will continue to be wounded by memories of that. They'll be, continue to be wounded anytime somebody does or says anything that reminds them of anything in the past, it can completely lock them down, shut them down, and, and they are not free to be able to live the life that God intended them to be able to live. Pastor, Here. there's a difference in this, in this topic. <coughs> the person looking at self and the Holy Spirit bringing to you your need or your your faults and, and God through his spirit does it in such a way that it that it humbles self and brings you to repentance uh, the same thing is with obedience we can set out to to obey and we'll end up in the same place that Paul found himself but when the Holy Spirit breaks your heart there's a desire to obey mm -hmm that is acceptable to God mm -hmm. because it is from a broken heart that is prompted by love. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> you know, the human nature is always trying to bypass that. We're always wanting to do it by ourselves. Yes. Uh, whether it be in, in trying to fix our own problems by analyzing ourselves and how bad I am and all this, all, all that's going to do is just drag us down. But when we come to the foot of the cross and the Holy Spirit has a role to play in it, there's a totally different outcome. Yes. You know, this is um, when the Holy Spirit brings conviction, he doesn't do so to break. He does so to call us to yield ourselves and to come find healing. Um, and sometimes in people's minds, they've been told you're not worth anything you're stupid and and the more you're told that the more those voices in your head become your own voices and then you're speaking that to yourself and um, this is not satan delights in that he wants to grind the face of humanity in the dirt and bring us down and the holy spirit never points out our wrongs and our, and, and our sins to nail us to the wall so to speak never i mean i, I think of jesus when he was at Simon's house, remember Simon the leper, he'd been healed. And, and that man is sitting there thinking, if Jesus were really a prophet, he would know about this woman. And who was responsible for getting that woman to where she was all the way back? It was him. And Jesus said, Simon, I got something to say to you. And Jesus spoke something to Simon directly. He did not reveal his sin. He did not expose him to the whole room. But he spoke something in such a way that Simon recognized that this woman was forgiven because she loved much. And he was not even gra grateful. He was not even expressing gratitude that Jesus had he he healed him from a living death. And Jesus spoke those words in such a way as to bring Simon face to face with himself, not for the purpose of breaking but for the purpose of healing. And there's a difference. That is, that is the difference of how the Spirit of God deals 
with us. That he's con- he, he does. He wants us to face what we have done if we've been sweeping it under the rug for so long. But he does so from the purpose to heal and not to break. All right, one more comment, and we're going to have to get going here because it's we're getting but running out of time. The, you know, this topic, you know, justification, okay. righteousness, faith, and then um, s- sanctification was a so hard word, and I was so hard to get it. But as I was reading Bibles and then Ellen G. White's book, and then it came to very simple to me. Justification is, uh, you know, we didn't, we were sinful, but uh, when God gave us the commandment, so we know which one is right or wrong, so we feel it, we are wrong, then we come to Jesus, and then he, we know so he's forgiving us. Amen. That's the justification. Amen. And righteousness of our faith, now we wanted to, you know, just listen to the God's commandment and we try to do it but we cannot do it with our own power Amen. so we know it's a god is going to help us so he sent us the holy spirit then we start to listening and obeying Amen. by our will and then with the holy spirit's help Amen. with the power that's Amen. the you know the um, righteousness of faith and then sanctification is we just keep trying to obey and then obey and then our character changes like a jesus you know we don't try anymore it's just our character change to the like his so that's a sanctification that's what I got it from simple word. Yes. I don't <laughs> I like that. I like that. You know, and I'll, I'll just say this as we close before I have prayer. You know what? All of our minds are different. And the things that click for me, how I understand it, sometimes a speaker might share something and it doesn't click for you. And then another speaker might share on this very same topic, on the very same thing, and they might share something that just clicks for you. We all have different minds. We all have different personalities. And if you're not getting it from me, you know, I pray that I pray that you do. I pray that we can. But you know what? There's limitations at the end of the day. This is a Bible truth. God wants us to stand before him fully accepted, fully forgiven. That cannot happen by our own works. But we, we need to seek for this. This, and to try and to wrap our minds, not only to understand it, but to experience it. We need to experience it and, and, and to be broken before God like this tax collector was more than we need to understand it. And I have all the pegs in the right places and I can tell you what it means. We need to make it part of our experience with Jesus. Let's pray as we head home tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, um, Lord, all our righteousnesses is as filthy rags. There is nothing good in us. Um, Father, whether we know that or understand that completely or whether we we hear that and we feel like we're being beat down or uh, whether we whether we just can't fathom or understand how that could possibly be. I don't I don't know where we all are tonight. But this I do know. Jesus Christ died to save sinners. And every single one of us, your word tells us, is a sinner. And that means that you love us. That means that you are working to save us. That means you are the one person in the whole universe we can trust. So, Father, we trust you tonight. We turn to you. You see our brokenness. You know where we are. And Jesus came to save sinners. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to set the captives free. Those who had been lied to and trampled upon by Satan and others, Father, you came for us. So, Father, we want to open our hearts to you. Teach us how to have and and put our faith and trust in you, that you are gracious, merciful, kind, and good, and you provided a way of escape for us. Father, speak to our hearts as we continue to explore this topic and open our hearts to say yes to you, that we may find acceptance, forgiveness, and peace through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Come home with us each now, and thank you for being with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
God bless you, and we'll hope to see you again tomorrow night. And by faith, we'll have Pastor Gaynor joining us tomorrow evening. All right, have a good night. Thank you.